Hi, let's talk about GraphQL beyond HTTP APIs. My name is Guilherme Vieira. Feel free to call me Guy. I live in Vancouver, Canada, and I work at Shopify in the API Pandas team. GraphQL is commonly used as an HTTP API. You submit a query to an endpoint and get a response. This is how our request looks like. The client converts the query and the variables into JSON, adds some kind of authorization header, and makes a post request. This is an example of a GraphQL server executing a query. Putting them side by side, we can see that the backend routes the HTTP method and path to a function or method. Then use the request payload as arguments to building a GraphQL query. It gets the variables and the query keys. And it makes the query aware of the current user by checking the authorization header. Then it executes the query and returns a JSON response. Web Framework is doing an excellent job on making very easy to get data from HTTP requests and performing any kind of business logic with them. This is very good, but can we go further? Executing GraphQL relies on very simple data structures that can come from anywhere, not only from HTTP requests. The query is just a string, the variables just a hash, and you're free to provide any context to the query execution. GraphQL doesn't depend on HTTP requests. HTTP is just a layer that transports your data, and GraphQL doesn't depend on any transport layer. GraphQL doesn't even require a network. This allows GraphQL to be used in a variety of use cases. Let's get to know some GraphQL use cases beyond HTTP APIs. The first example is WebSockets. Subscriptions is a very common use case of GraphQL using WebSockets, but we're not limited to that. We can use WebSockets for any kind of real-time communication or asynchronous communication where you send a query or a mutation, and you're not expecting to get a response right away. Or if you are sending several queries or mutations, you're not expecting to get the response in the same order you submitted. And because WebSockets keep open connections, it's very performant and very suitable for real-time messaging. In this example, the user is sending a message to a chat room. and we don't need to get the response of the mutation right away. We should be able to send several mutations and handle the response as they return. Another very good use case for GraphQL is in background jobs. We use background jobs for recurring tasks, for example, reporting, or sometimes for something that can be run asynchronous, like sending email notification. And we need to get some data for, for running those background jobs. And we can use GraphQL to get this data. It's very good because you get the, the data using the same business logic and formatting that you have, for example, for your HTTP API. So it's very easy to handle the data in a way it's useful for you. In this example, we have a daily sales report where we can generate the GraphQL variables, in this case, the beginning and the end of the previous day, and we run the GraphQL query, and the results is the data that will be used by the mailer to send the report by email. And you can have a predefined query, so this can be the query that returns all the data needed to generate the email report. So here you have the start and end date uh, timestamps that was generating when the background job run. And you have the number of orders for this particular time frame and some of the latest orders with some of the details. Another use case is for book operations. So book operations are background jobs, but they handle large amounts of data, both for importing and exporting. So for queries, it's very useful when you want to export large amounts of data. And if you see here, for the orders, 
it's a connection, but we are not we're not limited to, uh, for example, 100 records per page. So instead of having to paginate and we and get all the data for all orders, you can split this huge query into smaller pieces and then assemble all the data at the end. So this way it's fast and safe to get this kind of huge data export. Fermentations is a bit different. It's very useful when importing large amounts of data and you can provide all the input fields as a JSONL file and iterate over every line of the JSONL file. Another use case is when generating webhook payloads. So when you would have to deliver a webhook because some kind of event was triggered, it's very important to have consistency between the payload that you provide on your webhook and, for example, the data the user expects from the HTTP API. WebAssembly. So this is very nice. This allows us to execute any code that was provided by the user. And because we have control over how the GraphQL query is executed, you can limit, for example, you can deny any kind of mutations or you can override any kind of authorization or anything that you want. So it's very safe to execute untrusted code. And because many languages can compile to WebAssembly, it gives users a lot of flexibility. Thank you for watching. I hope to answer any questions in our Q&A session and see you soon.